These are our men. The Parker Watch Company dedicates this program to the United States Treasury Department for the sale of war bonds. With Frank Sinatra as our special guest today, we proudly present this new series of dramatic programs. These are our men. For total victory, these are our men. Marshall, King, Vandergrift, Eisenhower, Nimitz, MacArthur, Arnold, Wainwright, Halsey, Clark, Patton, Somerville, Wayne. Yes, these are our men. The men in whom 136 million Americans have placed the nation's trust, but about whom most of us know little or nothing. What do you know about Eisenhower? What sort of a man is bushy-browed Halsey? Are all those legends about MacArthur true? Who's known as the greatest strategist in the United States Navy? You'll learn the answers to all these questions and many more each week on this new series of programs presented by the Parker Watch Company. We're going to present the authentic life stories, the dramatic profiles of these men of ours who lead us to victory. Today we give you our Commander-in-Chief, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. <laughs> You'll hear President Roosevelt's story in just a minute with Mr. William Adams, the distinguished American actor impersonating Mr. Roosevelt. But first, well, how about a word from our guest, the boy who has sung his way into millions of hearts? And here he is, Frank Sinatra. Well, I guess I should start out by being formal, Frank, and say, on behalf of the United States Treasury Department, I want to thank you for joining us this afternoon as special bond salesman. Thank you, Jack, and I'd like to say on behalf of the United States Treasury Department, I'm very happy to be here. By the way, we're very proud of the fact that our sponsor is buying time for an outstanding series on a nationwide network and paying all the costs of the programs without a commercial announcement for their money. Ah, uh, 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 Jack, just a second. There will be commercials on this year's show. My gosh, you're right, Frank. We're here to sell war bonds, and we expect to hear from you on that score. Don't worry about a thing, Jackson. You sure will. But let's get on with the show, and I'll be back later. Right you are, Frank Sinatra. And now, episode number one of These Are Our Men, the life story of our commander-in-chief, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. <laughs> This is the story of a poor little rich boy who refused to have life handed to him on a silver platter. A poor little rich boy who worked and achieved greatness the hard way. This is the story of a burning ambition and a refusal to admit that any opposition was too big. The story of a shining career halted four times by illness, but never stopped. This is the story of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. <laughs> Watch out for New York and Pennsylvania. Yes, November 7th, 1944, a typical American election night with wild, excited crowds swarming in New York's Times Square, Chicago's Loop, and around the town hall in Tompkins Corner. One of the hottest elections in the nation's history was on its way to a decision, a precedent-smashing decision. Finally, it came. Ladies and gentlemen, beyond any doubt, it's Roosevelt for a fourth term. <laughs> So, for the first time in our history, we Americans sent a man back to the White House for his fourth term of office, thus serving notice on our enemies that when the welfare of our country is at stake, we are willing to sacrifice any tradition or smash any precedent. We all remember the first Roosevelt inauguration back in 1932, but even that was by no means Franklin Roosevelt's first visit to the White House. Let's go back to the White House study of Robert Cleveland in the year 1887. 
Oh, come in. Come in. I'm glad to see you. I know how busy you are, Mr. President. Good of you to see me. Why shouldn't I, James? At the way you worked for my election as governor of New York? And you helped make me president, too. Well, who's the young sailor you've got with you? Uh, Mr. Cleveland, I want you to meet my son, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. How do you do, Mr. Cleveland? Well, how do you do, young man? He's quite a big man to be only five, eh, Mr. President? Only five? Mm -hmm. Why, I was about to offer him a cigar. <laughs> <laughs> All dressed up in a sailor suit. I suppose when you grow up, young man, you want to be president, too, huh? Oh, no, sir. I want to be a sailor. Well, you got a mighty smart son there, James. I've had two years of this job, and I know it isn't easy. The country thinks you're doing a good job, Mr. President. I do my best, James. But... Well, young man, I want to make a wish for you. Yes, sir? My wish is this, that you may always have health and happiness and that you may never become President of the United States. In 1893, at the age of 11, Franklin Roosevelt had his first experience in action with the ideal which men and nations have come to know as liberty. It was in the office of the Imperial Guard in the fortified city of Strasbourg, Germany. Just after dark, the lieutenant of the guard was amusing himself with a music box. Herr Leutnant. Herr Leutnant. Ja, Corporal, what is it? I have with me two prisoners. Prisoners, eh? Then the officer of the guard should not receive them while playing a music box. Yeah. Who did you say? Bring them in. Ja, Herr Leutnant. Prisoner, Achtung, Star! Prisoner, halt! Oh, yes, I see. One is rather small, isn't he? Man, what's your name? Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Age. Eleven, going on twelve. Nationality? The United States of America. This is my tutor with me. Oh. Well, I see that paper sound order, Corporal. Start. Start. Placed under arrest for trying to enter his Imperial Germanic Majesty's fortified city of Strasbourg, and with or in a wheeled vehicle up the dock. We were on bicycles, sir, and it was your guard's fault. We were so late. If they hadn't arrested us so many times today, we'd have been here before dark. So you arrested more than once today. First time was when the goose ran in front of my bike. Yeah. Arrested and fined five marks. Then there were the cherries. Cherries? Oh, they were growing beside the road. Not inside a field, but hanging over the fence. Arrested again. Then we took our bikes through the waiting room at the station. And... Illegal, that. Yes, illegal. But that was the only way to get to the train. The soldiers got us, though. All that made us so late trying to get back to our hotel. That, that we... you arrested again trying to enter Strasbourg after dark. In the United States, we don't arrest people every time they turn around. That will do if you please. Corporal Lance. To be fair. You are to be congratulated on your proficiency in protecting the empire. You may go. Yeah, Herr Leutnant. Well, if the fine's too much, I can't pay it, and that's that. I've already spent most of my allowance on fines. Master Roosevelt, here in Germany, we do not do as we wish. In this country, we do as we are told. <laughs> That was Roosevelt's first lesson in the German way of doing things. He liked the American way best. Then, in the tradition of many American boys, he wanted to run away and go to sea. Later, he wanted to go to the Naval Academy, but his father talked him out of the notion. At 16, he was a student at Groton, when, in the year 1898... <laughs> Remember the Maine, a glorious call to a boy's heart, that slogan, a call that Franklin Roosevelt couldn't ignore. Parental consent was out of the question, and so young Roosevelt, with some of the other fellows, made deep-laid plans to run away and help fight the Spanish-American War. The plans were perfect, but just at the last moment. What's your name, young man? Roosevelt, Doctor. Franklin Roosevelt. What is it, sir? Measles, young fellow. Measles. <laughs> <laughs> a case of measles may have changed the entire course of Franklin Delano Roosevelt's life, for it stopped this attempt to become a part of the United States Navy. He remained at Groton and then went on to Harvard. There he became managing editor of the Harvard Crimson, and his editorials perhaps offer some clue to his later career. Hey, Bud, 
You've seen Frank Roosevelt's latest piece in the Crimson. No, what's Frank up to this time? Remember how he told the college officials the buildings were fire traps right to their teeth, he told them? And he got action, didn't he? They put in fire escape. Yeah, but this time it's serious. Listen to this. I'll read it. It is time the entire student body took an interest in the election of class officers. Too long these elections have been controlled by one fraternity, by a few students who are wealthy aristocrats. Officers should be elected on the basis of ability, not because of background or present circumstances. There, there you are. What does he mean, wealthy aristocrats? He's one of us himself, isn't ah, he? Ah, you know how Frank is. Always going around sticking out his jaw in favor of the underdog. <laughs> But toward the end of his last year at Harvard, Frank Roosevelt sometimes seemed lost in thought, absent-minded. There was a reason. Her name was Anna Eleanor Roosevelt, his sixth cousin. On St. Patrick's Day, 1905, they were married. The bride was given away by her uncle, President Teddy Roosevelt himself. After his marriage, the groom continued his postgraduate studies at Columbia University. Five years later, not yet 29, Roosevelt made his entry into politics as a result of a meeting in the town of Poughkeepsie. Well, gents, if that's all the business, I think we've got a good plate of candidates for this section of state. Oh, uh, Jack. Oh, Mayor Fegg, you've got something to say? Yes, to me. There's one candidate we've neglected to name. Hmm? So far, there's been no mention of a Democratic candidate for state senator from the counties of Dutchess, Putnam, and Columbia. <laughs> Why name one? Only one Democrat's been elected from there in more than 50 years. That's right. Yes, Mayor Sag, there's no money in the Treasury for a useless campaign. <laughs> so it happens, gents, I've taken care of that. I've got a candidate who can pay his own freight. Yeah. <laughs> it's young Frank Roosevelt. Will he make the race? I've convinced him that he should. His mother was against it, said it was too undignified for Roosevelt, would interfere with his career. <laughs> yes. I convinced her by telling her Frank didn't have a chance to win. <laughs> Well, then I don't see why you go to the bother of it. Well, young Roosevelt's funny. Apparently doesn't know much about politics. He's got the idea he might be elected and will be able to do the people some good. <laughs> Who does Frank Roosevelt think he is? Been in the state senate one week and he thinks he's big enough to whip Boss Murphy at Tammany. Murphy's made up his mind he'll send blue-eyed Billy Sheehan to the U.S. Senate. Yeah. But unless Frank Roosevelt and his little group vote for him, Boss Murphy whips. That's right. And Frank says Blue-Eyed Billy is a little too close to the New York Traction Trust to suit him. <laughs> if Frank doesn't expect to have much of a political career, it starts out by bucking the Traction Boys in Tammany Hall. It's a lot worse than that. His story about Roosevelt's in the papers all over the country. Yes, I know. It's raising such a smell that state legislatures might lose the right to elect U.S. senators. Sure. Why, if this thing goes far enough, might get to where U.S. senators are elected by the people. Well, blue-eyed Billy Sheehan of Buffalo did not go to the United States Senate, and the name of Franklin Roosevelt became one to reckon with. Then, in the spring of 1913, as he planned his campaign for re-election, he was stricken with typhoid. <laughs> But with his good friend, Louis McHenry Howe, managing his campaign, Roosevelt was re-elected to the New York State Senate from his sick bed. And thus began one of the warmest, firmest friendships in modern pol politics. Howe and Roosevelt. On March 1st, 1913, Roosevelt was in Washington for the inauguration of Woodrow Wilson. He was offered the job of collector of the Port of New York. He refused it. He was offered the job of assistant secretary of the Treasury. He refused it. Later that same day, he ran into Josephus Daniels, who offered him the one job in the government he wanted. He took it like a shot. At 31, he became Assistant Secretary of the Navy. The next year... The World War. As Assistant Secretary of the Navy, Franklin Roosevelt worked night and day that the United States Navy might be ready. In fact, he worked almost too well, for in 1917, about 10 days after the United States entered the war, he got a hurry call from the White House. Usher Ike Hoover took him straight to President Wilson's office. Yes, Mr. President, you sent for me. Oh, yes, Mr. Roosevelt.
This is General Hugh Scott, Chief of Staff of the Army. General, Mr. Roosevelt. Yes, I know. Yes, I've met the general. Now, uh, Mr. Roosevelt, there's something I want to talk about. Yes, Mr. President. About the way you've been buying supplies for the Navy. I admit I've cut red tape in a few cases, That's but... not the point. It's not how you've been getting supplies. It's the amount. But this is war, Mr. President. I want the Navy to have everything it needs to do its job. The men of our Navy deserve that, and... I know, I know. I see I may as well commend you. You've done a wonderful job. Thank you. Fact is, however, Mr. Roosevelt, we've also got an army in this country. That's what General Scott is here to see me about. Oh. You've been buying up supplies so fast that in a great many cases you've bought up all there are. No. Yes? Yeah? I'm sorry, Mr. Roosevelt, but the Navy will have to give up some of its supplies to the army. In June of 1918, Roosevelt was offered the Democratic nomination for the governorship of New York. He refused, suggesting another candidate, Alfred E. Smith. In July, he went abroad to inspect the battle zones. In England, he met the leaders of the day with one exception. He did not happen to run into the young man who was being blamed for the awful defeat at Gallipoli, Winston Churchill. In France, he met Clemenceau, Poincaré, and Marshal Foch. He toured the actual fighting areas at Belleau Wood, at Chateau Thierry, at Nancy. And when he boarded the Leviathan to come home, he had decided to resign and don the uniform of a fighting officer in the United States Navy. This was not to be. Well, how are you feeling this morning, Mr. Roosevelt? Very well. Fine, Doctor. Uh, uh, how many days out are we? Only two. You've been, well, asleep most of the time. There was a lot of flu in breast, I remember. Must have picked up a touch of it. It's better you picked up flu in breast than what they're having in New York now. In New York, there's an epidemic of infantile paralysis. <laughs> well, thank heaven I'm too old for that. When I said goodbye at the dock, I, I remember telling them I'd be back on the next boat. I'm afraid you won't be. But I've got to. You, you see... I may as well tell you, Mr. Roosevelt, when you leave the Leviathan in New York, you'll go on a stretcher. But this flu, Doctor, I'll shake it off. You had flu. Now it's double pneumonia. <laughs> By the time he had sufficiently recovered, the war was ending. He did not become an officer in the Navy. In the White House, Woodrow Wilson was making plans for his League of Nations, an ideal for which he fought up to the point where he could fight no more. But when the Democratic Convention of 1920 nominated James M. Cox for president and Franklin D. Roosevelt for vice president, the fading Woodrow Wilson begged them to carry on the fight for the League. They knew it might mean the end of their chances, but they could not refuse. In the election that followed, they were defeated. Mid-August, 1921. On a brief trip to his summer home at Campobello Island, Roosevelt was slightly chilled. With his children, he went for a two-mile run. Feeling better, he went for a swim in the icy open water of Fundy Bay. Back at the house, the mail was waiting. He sat in his wet bathing suit reading it until he felt chilled again. The next morning, he had symptoms of a cold, peculiar feelings in his legs. The second morning. I... I can't move. My legs. Why, I... I can't move them. Something's wrong. Anna! James! Say, doesn't anybody ever get up in this house? It's Louis Howe, Franklin. <laughs> yes, I knew it was Louis. I didn't even have to turn over and look. Well, how are you feeling? Better, I can tell that already. Fine, fine. We've sent for specialists. I've, uh, I've had a pretty full career for any man, Louis. Thank God it got me instead of the children. The mother wants me to come to Hyde Park. Stay there until, well, the rest of my days. And... What have you decided? I've decided to live the rest of my life as if this... this illness had never happened. Good. Good. I can help you do it. We can help him do it, Louis. I can look after business matters for you, see people that you wouldn't be able to see. I can attend political meetings for you, keep you posted on what's going on. But, Eleanor, you've never been mixed up much in politics. Perhaps I don't know much now. 
But I will. I'll learn. Then it's settled. It's settled, Franklin. The three of us will work together. For three tedious years, there was no improvement. Yet Franklin Roosevelt carried on his normal life, never once admitting that he could not walk. There had been a very slight improvement by 1924, and on crutches, he placed Al Smith in nomination for the presidency from the floor of Madison Square Garden. During the campaign, he worked 14 and 16 hours a day. Then he heard about Warm Springs, Georgia. The warm waters of the springs helped him, and he wanted to share its benefits with others less fortunate. Unknown even to some members of his family, he risked his private fortune in its development. Today, he considers it a major portion of his life's work. We want Roosevelt, yes. They wouldn't leave him in Warm Springs. In 1928, the people of his native state demanded that he come back home. We want Roosevelt, and they got him. He became governor of New York in 1928. And if his family were disturbed by his re-entrance into public life and the awful strain it threatened to place upon him, they still had cause for satisfaction. For just two days before his nomination, Franklin Roosevelt had taken his first steps without aid of any kind. <laughs> Franklin Delano Roosevelt has two characteristics that have often been noted. He has that hard-to-describe intangible called color, a flair for the dramatic. And he has the happy faculty of being able to put his thoughts into phrases that are easily remembered, into phrases that touch the hearts of millions. When he was nominated at Chicago in 1932, Roosevelt made a dramatic flight from New York to make his acceptance speech in person. The years ahead were to witness other dramatic journeys, to Mid-Atlantic for the historic charter meeting, to Casablanca, to Tehran, to Quebec. And the years ahead were to be marked by Roosevelt's spoken words that would etch themselves into men's souls. One of the most significant, one of the most prophetic of his utterances was this. There is a mysterious cycle in human events. To some generations, much is given. Of other generations, much is expected. This generation of Americans has a rendezvous with destiny. Yes, prophetic words indeed. For on a December day in 1941, this generation of Americans was forced to keep that awful rendezvous. that December Sunday, Americans had been divided. Then came the deed of treachery, and Franklin Delano Roosevelt welded national unity with truth. We are now in this war. We are all in it, all the way. Every single man, woman, and child is a partner in the most tremendous undertaking of our American history. Clashing opinion was dissolved by the common peril and 136 million people spoke their minds. Their spokesman was their commander-in-chief. No matter how long it may take us to overcome this premeditated invasion, the American people, in their righteous might, will win through to absolute victory. I believe that I interpret the will of the Congress and of the people when I assert that we will not only defend ourselves to the uttermost, but will make it very certain that this form of treachery shall never again endanger us. With confidence in our armed forces, with the unbounding determination of our people, we will gain the inevitable triumph. So help us, God. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you, William Adams, for your fine performance, your fine impersonation of our president. And now, Frank Sinatra. Thank you very much for that applause. Maybe I'd feel that I really deserve it if I could make you all go out and buy at least one extra war bond. But I'm not much of a salesman, and I'm going to show you how I can prove it. See, I've done an awful lot of jobs in my life trying to make a living. And like many other kids, I once tried to sell magazines from door to door. I guess I wasn't much good at it. And the guy in charge of us used to say, Look, Shorty, you've got to give them the old high pressure. You can't expect them to buy things unless you high pressure them into it. Perhaps that was good advice, but the truth is that I've never been able to high pressure anybody into doing anything. So don't expect any fancy speeches from me. All I can do is to tell you what I feel in my heart, and that is that nobody could find a better investment in the world today than United States war bonds. Nobody could find a safer investment. We all know the figures involved. In 10 years, you get 100 bucks back for every 75 you invest. And that return, as we say in Jersey, ain't hay. I don't believe that there are many Americans today who are buying war bonds just to make money on the deal. Not by a long shot. For somewhere today, a boy you know is maybe on a train, or on a ship, or marching through mud towards the fighting front. His gun and his food and the care he receives are all bought through you by buying your war bonds. Whether or not he comes back healthy and sound, whether he comes back at all depends on what those of us who are safe here at home do in the sixth war loan drive. Finally, I can say to you is go out and buy those war bonds. Buy every one you can afford. And remember when you do, that's your way of applauding the greatest performance America has ever had. The boys and girls in our armed services. Thank you. Thank you, Frank Sinatra. are our men, featuring today the dramatization of President Roosevelt's life story, and with Frank Sinatra as today's special guest, is presented each Saturday by the Parker Watch Company, but not to sell Parker watches. Our aim is to remind as many millions of Americans as we can reach that certain as we are in our ultimate victory, it can be too long delayed unless every one of us carries his share of the burden. Next Saturday, the Parker Watch Company will present the intensely interesting life story dramatization of General George C. Marshall, Army Chief of Staff. And as our guest, we will have Francho Tone. So for the sake of an entertaining and educational half hour, listen in next Saturday to These Are Our Men. And for the sake of our servicemen, buy at least one extra $100 bond between now and then. We're happy to announce that the Parker Watch Company is making these scripts available to all educational institutions throughout the country. This program featured the distinguished American actor, William Adams, who impersonated President Roosevelt, and Stotts Cotsworth, who was our narrator. Music was composed and conducted by Joseph Chernyovsky, and the entire production was under the direction of Anton M. Leder. <laughs> Are Our Men is being recorded by the Office of War Information for shortwave rebroadcast to foreign countries. This is Jack Costello speaking.